Hello Tech World, this is Tech Thoughts. In this video, we'll be doing a short unboxing of the Synology DS416 NAS unit, followed up by a quick how-to installation to get these three terabyte Western Digital Red NAS drives inside of that unit. And then we'll follow up with a quick um, configuration setup of how to use the Synology Assistant and the, uh, dis the Synology Disk Station Manager to set up your NAS box for initial use. So let's go ahead and get started by unpacking these Western Digital drives getting them out of their wrappers and ready to install on the Synology disk station. And with that completed, we can go ahead and unbox this unit. As you can see at the top, we start off with a power cable and just some general connectivity guide. Uh, we have the uh, two LAN cables that it comes with and the power brick. Just pretty standard stuff for a NAS unit. We'll go ahead and get all that uh, hardware out of the way, back into the box, some screws in there as well and get ready to actually open this up and see the actual NAS unit. So that comes nicely packaged and um, well protected. Go ahead and cut that open and get this thing out so you can see it. It looks pretty slick. I mean, I like the black. Uh, the front's kind of a piano black and it's easy to get fingerprints on. We'll go ahead and take that off. It comes with a plastic thing. I, le I recommend you leave that on it so you've got everything installed. That way you can keep the fingerprints off the front of your new NAS device. And this is just a simple release on the front panel where you can pull that, uh, that hard drive tray right out the front. We'll go ahead and remove all four of those and get those laid out because that's where we'll be placing these Western Digital 3 terabyte drives here in just a moment. So with all those out of the way, you can see inside that the, uh, the power and the SATA connections are already there on the board. And those drives are just gonna slide right in there and make connectivity uh, with power and, uh, and data connection. So these will actually just lay right flat in the tray and you'll need to remove the two side um, latching pieces. You'll notice when I put the drive in, it'll go ahead and pop out that latching piece and the drive actually won't sit with those uh, still in the tray. So you'll need to remove both of those. And once you do, the, the drive will stay nice and flat inside of that tray for you. And you will go ahead and line up the holes on that drive and then you can just take those those latch releases and go ahead and slide them back in and pop them in you'll hear a nice satisfying click and that will actually secure the drive inside of the tray. This is just a, uh, a proprietary thing that Synology has come up with just to kind of really quickly get those drives in there. You don't have to mess around with screws or anything like that. So with that in place you just go ahead and slide that unit very carefully make sure that you're lined up properly so you don't damage anything in the back and slide it in and get a nice satisfying click letting you know that, that drive has engaged the two connectors in the back and is ready to go. And just repeat that process for each of the drives for however many bays uh, that you have in your NAS unit. This is the DS416, so it has four bays. We'll go ahead and get all those drives slotted in their trays and back in the unit. All right, once they're completed, give all those drives a nice tug and make sure they're nice and secure. And you're ready at this point to go ahead and make sure that everything is set up the way you like it. Make sure that you're just not all, everything's aligned and connected properly. And once you're satisfied that that's all set up the way you like, go ahead and pop that initial tray back on. It's just got a couple grommets and slides right back in place. Go ahead and push that back on. And it's just kind of a, a holder, just kind of a cosmetic thing to keep it in, looking nice. All right, so before we get started configuring the Synology unit, we'll need to perform a couple of prerequisite steps by visiting the Synology.com website, which you can see the link right here. And we'll go ahead and click on support. And we need to visit the download center to download a couple of files that we'll need to configure our Synology unit. It'll ask you what type of unit that you're using, and we're using a four bay unit. And then we need to select a model. Since I selected four bay, we see all the available four bay models from Synology, and I'm looking for the DS416, which I'll go ahead and select. This will give me all of the applicable downloads for that particular model. So we'll need the Synology Assistant to go ahead and get started, so I'll go ahead and download that. And we'll also need the Disk Station Manager to get started. So I'll go ahead and download it as well. Once the Synology Assistant has finished downloading, you can go ahead and get it installed. Just your basic wizard where you click next, next, next a couple times, and I've gone already ahead and done that. So I'll go ahead and type in Synology Assistant and bring that program up. You can search with the Synology Assistant, which will find all available disk stations within your network. As you can see, I have a new disk station a DS416 model that does not currently have the disk station manager installed. Let's make sure that's gone ahead and finished downloading. It has. So I can go ahead and right click on this and click install. And it will prompt me for the location 
for that disk station manager download that I just uh, completed a minute ago. So we'll go ahead and browse to downloads and you can see here the DS416 disk station manager file that I downloaded a minute ago is available and I'll go ahead and click OK. So go ahead and click Next. It's going to prompt you to create an initial password for that admin account. Make sure that you don't forget this as if you do you'll have to reset the entire unit and start over from scratch. And it'll ask you for a server name. I'm going to go ahead and leave this as default for right now. You can always rename this as a later time. And it'll ask you if you want to create a certain volume after the installation. I'm going to go ahead and create that manually later so I don't want it to take care of that for me in an automatic fashion. Since I want to set some specifics around how I'm going to configure my hard drives, which I'll go into in a later video. So I'll go ahead and click Next. I recommend that you not allow the Synology unit to get a DHCP automatic IP address. Although this is recommended by Synology and may be appropriate for some more basic users, having a DHCP address really limits your ability to access the unit from outside of the home and really limits the functionality of the device as you will most likely need to configure some type of port forwarding which requires a static IP. I'm going to go ahead and configure a static IP for my network now with 225. And I'll go ahead and keep that default gateway and DNS address as that's appropriate for my network. For most home users, this will default gateway and DNS server will be the IP address of the router that's inside your home. And I'll go ahead and click finish. The Synology unit verified that IP address that I specified wasn't currently in use. And now that it's verified that IP address of 225 is good, it's going to go ahead and do an initial format of the system, upload the disk station manager file that we downloaded a minute ago, and do some initial configuration of the disk station. All right, so once the installation progress is completed, you can go ahead and click close. And from this point forward, we can manage the disk station through a web browser. You can use the Synology Assistant to right click and go ahead and click connect which will basically just open up a browser and connect to the IP address that you assigned earlier. You could have also gotten here by just typing in the IP address 192.168.1.225 or whatever IP address that you assigned to your disk station. Go ahead and log in with the credentials that you specified earlier in the configuration. And click next. The first question that's going to prompt you for is how it's going to handle future disk station manager updates. I recommend that you do allow it to update automatically unless you're running some type of high availability scenario where you can't have downtime on your disk station. But for most home users, automatic updates is a good idea. You can go ahead and specify a installation schedule here that allows the disk station to update at times that don't impact your normal usage. I'll go ahead and choose Sundays at 3 a.m. Go ahead and leave Run Smart Test to check the health of your hard drive periodically checked, as that's a good idea to allow the disk station to just check the general health of your drive on an ongoing basis. Click Next. Alright, on the Quick Connect screen you'll have the opportunity to create a Synology account and a Quick Connect ID. These both enable some additional functionality of your Synology, especially when accessing it outside of your home. So if you're at work or on the go and you want to access your NAS device, a Synology account and the Quick Connect ID can help with those. So if you don't have one of those currently, I recommend that you go ahead and set up one here. Once you've got your Quick Connect ID provisioned, go ahead and copy that link as you'll need that access to that link at a later time. Go ahead and click Next. Once you're logged in, the first thing I recommend that you do is go to the control panel and go ahead and click that update and restore button and just verify that you are on the latest version of the disk station manager. You'll see in the status that it's checking for the latest DSM update and you can go ahead and click the download button to snag that latest copy from Synology. Once the download is complete, you can go ahead and click update now then it'll take approximately five to 10 minutes to go ahead and uh, install that disk station manager and reboot your system. All right, so once your Synology box is completely up to date, you might wanna go over to the control panel and look in the information center. 
you just make sure that the CPU and memory is all reporting as you expect for the model that you purchased. And then hop over to storage and make sure that the hard disks that you've inserted are all showing up with the correct size and showing a status of initialized or some other green status uh, indicating that the drives are in a healthy and ready to use state. Once you're satisfied that the initial hardware is set up and configured properly, you'll likely want to get started creating your first system volume. So we'll bring up the main menu and head over to the storage manager. And inside storage manager, you'll notice that our first volume has not been created and there's no volume currently on the system. If we go down to hard drives, our four drives on this DS416 are ready for usage, but they haven't been configured in SHR or RAID yet. We can hop over to the RAID calculator on the Synology site to get a better idea of what type of RAID is best gonna serve us. Now I have a four bay model with four three terabyte drives. So I simply drag those three terabyte drives to indicate that I have four in the unit. And I can use these ray type calculators down here to determine how many drives I can actually withstand a failure for and how much actual usable space I'll be left with. So although I have four uh, times three, which gives me 12 terabytes of raw storage, you'll notice that if I elect to go with RAID 5 on this configuration that I only have nine terabytes usable with one of those drives being used for protection. If I set up to RAID 6, we can see that I can withstand two drive failures, but I drop down to six usable terabytes. And while RAID 10 will get me quite a bit of speed, um, again, still only six terabytes usable. For this configuration, I need the nine terabytes, and I'm okay with just being able to withstand one disk failure, so I'm going to choose RAID 5. SHR is the native Synology RAID option. It's not technically RAID, it's more of a homegrown Synology solution. My own research into that choice indicates that it's best used when you're using a wide variety of different drives that aren't of the same make or configuration. SHR may be more appropriate. It acts kind of like RAID 5 with a one drive failure. And you can see here again, uh, uh, that indicated by nine terabytes usable with one drive being used for protection. Since these drive models are all identical, I'm gonna be using RAID 5 instead. So we'll hop back over to the NAS station, come back up to volume, and we're gonna create our first volume. Now, if you wanna use the SHR, you're gonna use the quick option, but since we're gonna be engaging RAID 5 on this, I'm gonna click custom and click next. And this is gonna be a single volume on this RAID. So you can configure multiple different RAID configurations. Um, you can definitely explore that if you have a lot of drives in your bay unit. But since I only have four drives in this model, I'm gonna stick with just a single volume for that RAID. I'm gonna include all disks inside of this RAID array. It's gonna let me know that everything on those disks is gonna be erased. Since they're brand new, that's fine with me. I'm gonna click okay. Again, make sure that you choose the appropriate RAID as that if you have to go back and change this, you will lose all the data on all the drives. You can give your volume a description to let you know what it's doing. and you get a confirmation screen, you can go ahead and click apply. Once the volume is created, your Synology unit will begin a verification process of the hard disks that are inside the RAID array. This process can take up to 24 hours or longer depending on how big your hard drives are and the size of the volume that you've provisioned. You can use the unit while it's in this state, but it will be much slower. And you can see that warning here, the parity consistency check is currently running on volume one and may have an overall system performance impact and it definitely will. Your, your Synology box will be sluggish during this period. But once it's complete, the Synology box will just return to normal operation. All right, with an initial configuration done and a volume created, we can now create our first shared folder. So we'll hop back over to Control Panel, click on Shared Folders, and create our first shared folder. I'll be using the Synology unit to store some videos, so I'll name my first shared folder videos. This new shared folder will show up in your My Network Places on devices throughout your environment that have the discovery capability of detecting available network shares. If you would prefer this location to not show up in that location, you can go ahead and hide the shared folder in My Network Places. And that'll keep this from popping up on MacBooks and other Windows devices that are inside of your environment. 
While users without permission to this location will be able to see it, you can click hide subfolders and files from users without permissions if you don't want them to be able to click into that folder and see what subfolders are underneath. It's always a good idea to enable the recycle bin. When you're deleting things off the NAS box, it's kind of permanent in nature, but by enabling a recycle bin on your shared folder, when you delete something off the NAS box, it will actually go into the NAS recycle bin, giving you an opportunity to retrieve that file in case it's something that you really need to get back. And of course, Synology allows encryption for all its shared folders. So if security is paramount, you can go ahead and encrypt that folder at this time. I'm good with just the name description and enabling my recycle bin. I'll go ahead and click OK. So the first thing we'll get is a permission screen and we can say who has access to this particular share folder. I'll go ahead and give admins read write. Jake read write and guests will have no access. And I'll click OK. All right, now that the shared folder has been created, I should be able to pop over to a device and visit that network location by typing in the WACWAC IP address and the name of the shared folder. When I click enter, I should get prompted for some credentials from the NAS box. And I'll enter a user that has the appropriate permissions to access that folder. And since we enable that recycle bin, that's the first folder we have access to. And now we can create new folders here. And these will be available from any device within the network as long as that user has permission to access the share. If you want something more persistent, you can always map a drive. Give it a drive letter, we'll give it V for video. And go ahead and specify a user that has the necessary permissions to access that device. And now when I'm logged into this device, I'll have a network drive V for my videos. Regardless of which Synology model do you have, where you go with your Synology NAS device from this point is really up to you. The disk station manager has literally thousands of options and you can turn your Synology unit into anything from a web server to an FTP server to a mail server to just a simple file hosting server. So you have a lot of flexibility on the Synology device as to uh, what you can do. And if there's some demand, I may explore doing a more advanced video in the future where I cover some more of the advanced options in the disk station manager. For now, I hope that you enjoyed this short unboxing video and initial setup and configuration guide on the DS416 Synology NAS unit. And make sure to check out the corresponding blog post on techthoughts.info.